where I realized that after a while you write about every Beatles American record that's been out there and they're not going to be any more. So I thought, well, this would be my last book on the series. And liking puns like the Beatles did, you know, Rubber Soul and things like that, I thought I would call my book The Beatles Swan Song because it was my swan song. And what the book covers is it covers the releases that labels had who just had limited rights to the Beatles, such as the She Loves You single, which was out on Swan. And um, then what I did was I said, well, that'll be good. It covers a lot of things. But what about those capital releases from the 70s and 80s? I hadn't really covered them in my books. And I thought, do people really care about that stuff? And then I thought about it. And I said, well, there are people in the world that are younger than me. And those people might have been introduced to the Beatles through rock and roll music and love songs. And they might really be interested in finding out about those albums. So I thought, well, half the book, and I'll talk about that other half tomorrow, uh, will cover things like the She Loves You single, the United Artist, the Hard Day's Night soundtrack, the German recordings that came out on DECA, on ATCO, on MGM. But the second part of the book, and of course, me being dyslexic, decided to do the second part first, um, you know, uh, would cover the Capitol Records. So to put it into proper context, the Beatles had a contract with EMI for their British releases and Capitol Records in the States. And they renegotiated the contract a couple of times. And the contract that they were operating on going into the late 60s, into the 70s, uh, expired on January something, real early in January, 1976. And prior to that time frame, when we got to the White Album and Hey Jude moving forward, the Beatles had creative control and they insisted that their records be released the same in England as they were in the United States. And, you know, the states would have to keep it the same. In other words, worldwide, we have control now. If we put together an album in England and we send you the tapes, you can't change it. Those of you who have seen my other talks are very familiar with how Capitol Records reconfigured the British albums. And my books, the Capitol Records parts one and two, go into that in great depth. Word of warning, um, I, I, I'm here to, to, of course, meet with you all, have fun, but I'm also here to plug my books and sell my books. So you will be exposed to shameless plugs this morning. Um, however, the good news is, when you used to watch the Bob Newhart show, how many people in college did that game? Anytime someone said Bob, you had to drink a beer. So anytime I plug one of my books, you have to have something to drink. So keep that in mind. And I think Mark said something about that. He was going to treat everyone to all those drinks, so you don't even have to pay for them. <laughs> but anyway, so I'll be doing that. The, the Capital books, particularly the first book, Capital Volume 1, is coming close to selling out. The reason I point that out is those of you who had the good fortune to buy my VJ book now know that when you go on eBay to see what it sells for on eBay, it's sold out. It sells for between two and $400. So um, a word to the wise, if you're thinking about buying the Capital books, don't put it off that much longer. So anyway, what happens is the contract expires. And now we're in a situation of early 1976 in Capital and EMI can put out Beatle recordings because they own the masters. But for this time period, the Beatles do not have creative control. They can do whatever they want in marketing the Beatles. So this is a wonderful opportunity for Capital. And the surprising thing is it gets off to a very strange start because the very first record put out in this new phase is, believe it or not, here we go. Now well, let's see, is it working? Yeah, we go. Helter Skelter, promotional issue. And one of the interesting things about the label here, it calls the group Beatles rather than the Beatles. This was a promotional record, and you might be wondering, well, why was this put out? And I think a lot of people said, oh, well, Helter Skelter was on the rock and roll music collection, so that must be it, right? Wrong. Look at the label. From the LP, The Beatles. So the album Rock and Roll Music hadn't even been, uh, you know, worked out at this time. Well, believe it or not, the reason this record came out was to tie in with this. A TV, made-for-TV movie called Helter Skelter about the Charles Manson murders. So that was how Capitol Records started off with this newfound freedom that they had. Well, anyway, they realized, though, that Helter Skelter wasn't that bad a song, and maybe we should do it, but not as an A-side. So when they did put together the rock and roll 
music album, they used it as the B side, and the A side was Got to Get You Into My Life. Now you might wonder, well, why did they pick that song as a hit, you know, to be a single? Well, it, it is a great song. And also, Paul at the time was doing a few things. He was doing quite well on the charts. Silly Love Songs was number one on the charts. And so the idea was, well, Paul is probably the most popular Beatle now. And also, Paul had signed with Capitol Records. So, so it was kind of nice, you know, we'll do this for Paul, and we'll also think it's a really good song, which it was. And so it was released as a single, and it worked its way up to the charts in May of 1976, and got up to number seven on the charts, which is not bad for an album track from Revolver that was many years old, over 10 years old. So for the rock and roll music album itself, uh, well, this was a cover to it. And uh, you can see a lot of people kind of looked at that and they thought it was kind of garish and tacky. And the idea that Capitol had done was, well, you know, rock and roll music, 1950s, Happy Days is a big TV show right now. So it took on a 1950s motif. The only, and we'll look at the inside gatefold, you know, Marilyn Monroe, drive-in theaters, cherry colors and the whole thing. The only problem is, when did the Beatles release their records in the United States? Wasn't that the 1960s? So, needless to say, fans were not terribly enthused with the cover. Uh, but what Capitol did was they did a massive marketing campaign. And uh, if you can see the bottom of this store mobile display, it has your two record set as advertised on TV. Like this was something really wonderful. Gee, I was thinking about buying the new Beatles record, but I'm not sure. But wait a minute, it was advertised on TV. I'm going to run out and buy it. But, you know, and we laugh about that now. But the point is that up till then, you really didn't have much marketing on TV um, for things. And, of course, now it's very common. You market through Starbucks, through TV, billboards, everything. But once again, Capital was sort of at the vanguard of marketing by advertising something on TV to make it more legitimate. Um, the posters that they came out with, you know, once again, Fabulous, 28 hits, two record set as advertised on TV. Now, gee, I'm going to run out and buy that one. And then also, they came out with this poster as well. Kind of an interesting collage. And they, they used this thing more than once. But anyway, the record did come out. And it actually got to number two on the chart, which is not that bad by any means. And it ended up being blocked from the number one spot by Wings at the Speed of Sound by Paul McCartney. So the Beatles were on a pretty good roll at that time, even though they had broken up. Well, Capitol Records, um, later on, we get to late 1976, and they realize, gee, you know, I bet if we were to release for the Christmas season another pair of Beatles songs, we could make some money. And so they came out and released Oh Blah Dee, Oh Blah Da. And they decided to make it sort of like the White Album. They numbered the picture sleeves. This one from my collection is number 16, which is a nice low number. And the idea, once again, was, you know, we'll, we'll do something nice for Paul because Paul always wanted Oh Blah Dee, Oh Blah Da to be a single from the White Album. But George and John, who didn't particularly like the song, blocked it. So, you know, we can do whatever we want. We'll be nice to Paul. We'll release it as the A side. And we'll put Julia on the B side for John. And so that record did not do that well. Believe it or not, it only got to number 49 on the charts. Well, we move forward to 1977 and Capitol has something in their vaults that they're just dying to do something with. When the Beatles played the Hollywood Bowl, back in 1964, Capitol Records recorded the concert, and they wanted to release that as an album. However, George Martin and the Beatles felt that the sound quality wasn't that good, and their thinking was, you know, well, the studio songs sound better. Who would want to buy a live album, you know? Well, and they didn't listen to Capitol. In England, maybe people wouldn't have rushed to buy this live album, but in the United States, it would have done extremely well. The Beach Boys released a live album around the same time, and it sold, you know, just you know, a million copies, no problem. So you can imagine what the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl would have done. And when I was doing my Capitol Albums book, which you should buy so everyone gets to have another drink, thank you very much, um, one of the things that I did was I thought, you know, and it was late at night, it was approaching midnight, and I got in a goofy mood and I thought, well, Capitol did not design an album jacket for the Hollywood Bowl album, but if they did, what would it have looked like? Well, that's what it would have looked like. And it kind of took, an, it was kind of a combination of a Beach Boys live album and the Something New album. 
And, and I thought, well, what would they have written on it? They would have said, you know, featuring the number one hits, you know, and then these great rockers. And of course I lifted, you know, we'll go, go back and let's stay on that album cover. And I listed, you know, If I Fell as a great rocker, because, you know, according to Capital, it probably would be. And then, you know, plus for the first time on Capital, the hit single, Twist and Shout. So even if you had Twist and Shout, you didn't have it on Capital. So that would be reason to buy the album. And Ringo's rendition of Boys, because as everyone knows, Ringo was the most popular Beatle in the United States at that time. So anyway, I went ahead and I had this album cover done. The book came out. And at first of all, I sent it to the head of the art department of Capitol, who was in the 1960s, a guy named George Osaki. And he loved it. He said, yeah, that's exactly what we would have done. But the biggest compliment paid to me about this cover was, you may have seen this on about at least three or four different bootleg CDs. They have bootlegged my cover for their Hollywood Bowl CDs. And of course, they don't send me royalty checks or anything about it. They don't even send me a free copy of the CD. I had to buy a Hollywood Bowl CD with my cover on it to get my cover in my collection. And it's really crazy. But, and quite frankly, I like my cover better than the cover that was actually used, right here. You know, I know that's kind of all dull and boring cover. They created some tickets for the show. Of course, they got the dates wrong on the tickets. They had the concerts appearing on the wrong night of the week, but no big deal. And the original Hollywood Bowl tickets didn't have images of the Beatles, so they added the images of the Beatles to the tickets to make it look more attractive. But they did a big campaign, you know, available for the first time, the live concerts. What they did was they combined the 64 concert and the 65 concert. It wasn't really Capitol who did this. They basically told George Martin they wanted to release it. And George Martin listened to the tapes of the 64 concert and the 65 concert, and there were certain performances that he felt weren't that good, you know. Maybe like, you know, on, um, you know, I want to hold your hand. They didn't quite hit the notes just as they should have. Or and if I fell, they may have missed a note. So for that reason, those songs didn't appear. And they just did the two different concerts together. Very elaborate campaign for it. Very colorful posters. And also um, the store display. A, a huge thing, actually, is things about that tall. Uh, and, uh, you know, very attractive. The, the weird thing about this display, though, is when you look at it, Someone in their art department screwed up because nowhere on this does it say Capitol Records, which is an amazing thing for a record company to miss an opportunity to plug themselves. Um, but the record um, did come out on May 4th, 1977, and uh, did quite well uh, on the charts, sold a bunch of copies. It, it is not available on CD yet legitimately, although we do think at some point in time it probably will. Well, Capitol's next project was, well, we've gone out and we've given people rock and roll music, but the Beatles weren't just great rock and rollers. They also did write great love songs. So why don't we come out with a collection of love songs? And to start off the things, we'll have a single for that, which will come out before the album. Sort of like, remember what they did with rock and roll music. So the idea was they were going to release Girl back with You're Going to Lose That Girl as a single. And they went ahead and printed up the picture sleeves. And they went ahead and did the promo record that has girl on both sides, one mono and one stereo. The reason they did that was radio stations in those days, the AM stations were still broadcasting in mono. So therefore, you wanted to give them mono records. And then Capital began thinking about that. You know, girl is, is girl really going to be a hit single? You know, let's think about it. It's a great song, but is it a hit single? No, it's not. And then also, wouldn't it be kind of confusing? The new Beatles single is Girl, back with You're Gonna Lose That Girl. That sounds kind of strange, you know. We have a girl, and now we're going to lose her? No, we don't want to do that. So they went as far as printing labels for the record, but the record never came out. But love songs did come out. And what you see here is kind of a simulated leather-type jacket that it came in. They spent a lot of money on, on the packaging for this. They did a great job on the packaging, by the way. And um, they had a problem, though, because they had this great Richard Avedon picture that they wanted to use for kind of a Love Songs logo. It was just you know, going to be this double album of you know, Love Songs. And this is the original Richard Avedon picture. And let's take a look closely at it. We have Paul. We have Ringo, a big, big picture of Ringo. George kind of in the background, a big, big picture of John. But remember, Paul was with Capitol Records. Ringo wasn't with Capitol Records. Ringo, by 1977, he's not the most popular Beatle in America anymore. 
So what do they do? Watch closely. Whoop. Let's go backwards one more time. Yep, let's go forward again. Yep, okay. Gee, poor Ringo. He got his head chopped off and moved over to where Paul was. So they did kind of a face, full head transplant. There it was. Anyway, and uh, when Love Songs came out on October 21st, 1977, during the Christmas season, and the amazing thing is it only got to number 24 on the charts, but it was a steady catalog seller, and it's ended up selling over one and a half million units, which is very respectable sales. So although it wasn't a hit album, it certainly was a staple. In other words, it was the kind of thing that Beatle fans didn't rush out and buy for Christmas, but over the years, they bought it because it was a nice collection. Uh, and then, well, we reached the point where um, there was this movie in February of 1964 instead. And that might be a more appealing cover, you know, rather than trying to make people think the Beatles recorded during the 1950s. And the, while the front cover looked okay, the back cover left a lot to be desired. <laughs> you can tell they spent a lot of money on that one. Well. Capitol was kind of in a situation where they were coming up with different ideas for Beatle albums. We did rock and roll music. We did love songs. One of the ideas they had was that we'll do an album of Beatle girls, you know, Michelle, Julia, everybody else, Eleanor Rigby. Any, any more ideas? Yeah, Anna. Great stuff. Um, Her Majesty, certainly. She was a Beatle girl, if there ever was one. And um, anyway, the, um, that never came about. They also thought about maybe doing, you know, psychedelic Beatles. That one would, would have been kind of fun if you think about it. Uh, you would have had, uh, you know, the, the heavy Beatle type songs. And then I, I think they certainly must have thought about doing one, you know, country Beatles. If you think about country Beatles, it would have been a Beatles album where Ringo had more lead vocals than anyone. <laughs> that probably was reason alone to have them have second thoughts about country Beatles. But anyway, those were some of the things. But then they got the idea of, you know, the Beatles did a lot of movies. What if we put together an album of songs that were in the Beatle movies? And because we like puns, you know, Rubber Soul was a nice pun. Yesterday and Today was a pun. It has a song yesterday. We also have songs from today. We'll do something and we'll call it Real Music. And so that album came out, Fancy Cover. And before they released it, they came out with a movie medley. Um, and at the time, all the rage was, I had this thing called Stars on 45. How many people remember Stars on 45? It was a bunch of studio musicians from the Netherlands, and I think it started off with the guitar riff from the song Venus, I and mean, the next thing you know, it goes into all these Beatle tracks. Well, the next thing you know, this thing is like on the top of the charts, and it's a big hit. It was also during the time of disco, and something would have a beat that wouldn't change forever, and you know, and people were really into that. So. Capital got the idea, you know, gee, if people would like Stars on 45 with Beatle music played by studio musicians, imagine if we took like, you know, five or six Beatles songs and we did a Beatles movie medley. The problem was the songs didn't have the same beat. They didn't work well. You had to speed certain songs up, slow other things down. And how many people in here think that the Beatles movie medley, if you've heard it, think it was really good, raise your hand. One, two hands, okay. How many, or three, how many people think it sounded horrendous? You know, raise your hand. I mean, look, you know me, I say a lot of great things about Capitol. I'm a consultant with Capitol Records, but the good news is anyone associated with that movie medley doesn't work at Capitol anymore, so I can trash it without worrying about being fired. Anyway, I, I think it's horrendous. So um, I, I gotta call it like I hear it. But anyway, it was released as a single and it actually got up to number 12 on the charts. And when the album itself came out, and I don't know, some people like the cover, some people hate the cover. I, I kind of think it's cool. I, I'm not in the category that hates it. They show multiple images of the Beatles in different stages of their movie careers. Uh, you've got a walrus jumping out of a limousine. You've got John and George from Help. You've got the Beatles from A Hard Day's Night. You know, and, and I think it's kind of an interesting um, cover. They went all out on the promotional aspects. They had like this gold vinyl for the disc jockeys to try to get disc jockeys to get excited about it. They took out advertisements and in the poster, I think it's a real attractive poster, 
By the way, all these images you're seeing uh, here today, they can be yours if you buy them in the marketplace over there. It'll probably cost you several thousand dollars. Or on the alternative, you can buy the Beatles' swan song for $50, and you'll have them all in the book. And you won't have to you know, pay more insurance premiums or anything. So everyone gets another beer for that. All right, now, Capital then got another idea. You know, we're doing all these theme albums, and they thought, you know, and it wasn't just Capital. EMI really had this idea. The idea was that we were approaching the 20th anniversary of the Beatles releasing Love Me Do. So although Neil Aspinall didn't like anniversaries, remember, creative control at the time rested with EMI and Capital. And so EMI was thinking, well, 20th anniversary, you know, here's an interesting thing. What about if we took 20 Beatles songs and we put them on an album? You know, 20 big hits. And Capital liked the idea too, and so Capital's version of it had contains 20 number one hits. And this album came out, and um, it sounded like a no-brainer. You know, people were gonna rush out and buy it, it would do really well. And the strange thing about it was the record didn't do that well. It got up to number 50 on the charts. Not terribly good for a Beatles album. But over the years, it did manage to sell two million units. So I remember back, oh, I guess it was about the year 2000, 2001-ish around, that I read somewhere that Apple Records, in their infinite wisdom, has decided to come out with a CD that's going to be called Beatles One. And it's going to have all the number one hits on it. And I'm thinking, oh boy, that's really creative. I remember when Capital and EMI did that in the 1980s. That just burned the charts up. It got up to number 50. You know, who is going to buy this thing? I mean, look, I'll buy it because I'm a Beatles collector. I'll buy anything. Probably half the people who attend Beatle Fest will buy it. You know, they'll buy anything Beatles. But who's going to buy this stupid Beatles One collection? Of course, the thing comes out, sells 28, 29 million copies worldwide, 8 million in the U.S. Why was Beatles One a success and this wasn't? Well, think about it. Beatles were available on CD at the time, and if you wanted the best Beatles music, the hits and all, you had to buy the red collection of double CD and the blue collection of double CD. Retail price, $64. Beatles One came out, and you could go to Best Buy and buy it for $11. So now you can get all this great Beatles music for $11. Anyone can afford it. And so people went out and bought it for themselves. Kids bought it. You know, and the amazing thing about Beatles One is as great a listening experience as it is, how many songs from Sgt. Pepper on Beatles One? None. Yeah. How many songs from the White Album? Yeah. You get the idea. I mean, it's all these great, and so it just touches the surface of them. And what was cool about it was, you know, if you, say, had a, a child who came to you and said, you know, gee, my son bought, um, you know, a friend of mine at school has Beatles One. Can you buy it for me for Christmas? And you buy it for your kid, and he listens to it. And he says, boy, this is really great. And you say, yeah, but some of the Beatles' recordings aren't on this. And then all of a sudden, what do you mean? Well, Sergeant Pepper. And so it was also a jumping point to expose people to other things. While Beatles 1 was a very simple idea, it was a great idea if you think about it. If I gave you an assignment, each and every one of you, I want you to go away for 20 minutes with pen and paper, come back and give me 72 minutes of the best Beatles music. How many different lists do you think I'd have? Probably everyone in this room would have a different list. But by saying we're only going to have songs that hit number one in either Billboard or Record Retailer, we have an objective way of doing something. And so it was great. And the only thing I was felt bad about was because Please Please Me never hit number one in the States because I want to hold your hand and she loves you blocked it. In England, it was number one on four out of five surveys, but it wasn't number one on Record Retailer. So Please Please Me, which really was the record that started Beatlemania in England, is not on Beatles 1. And that's a shame. And that is one thing I would have done differently. But anyway, moving back to our good friends at Capitol, they did decide to um, plug this thing, 20 number one hits, one amazing record. And as I said, it, for whatever reason, didn't sell that well. Um, they also came out and re-released Love Me Do and pushed it as being from the Beatles' 20 greatest hits. Um, and while Love Me Do was not a big hit in England when it initially was released, it did hit number one 
in the States because it was released in April of 64 at the height of Beatlemania. And what they did was they used a capital swirl label for Love Me Do. Um, the, um, by the way, in the United States, when Love Me Do came out as a single, it was on a VJ subsidiary called Tolly. But for our Canadian friends in the audience, if any of them are, them are here, Capital did release, Capital of Canada did begin releasing Beatle records from the very beginning. So it was on that Capital record. And let's see, what do we have next? We have, then Capital went ahead on the 20th anniversary of I Want to Hold Your Hand and reissued that on the Capital Swirl label once again. Um, for the picture sleeve when this came out, well, if you look closely, Paul's cigarette's been airbrushed out of his hand. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, it looks, uh, it looks kind of strange like that, you know. Now, what is Paul doing? Maybe Paul's kind of, I don't know, let's see. Um, <laughs> live long and prosper for the Truckee fans. Anyway, <laughs> so then, um, Capital got to a point where it was like, you know, we know that there are songs by the Beatles that have yet to be released. And let's go ahead and release them. So they were going to release a Beatles 45 with Leave My Kitten Alone, which was a John Lennon vocal. Very good song, everybody. You didn't have a song. It eventually came out on Anthology. And that was going to be the picture sleeve for it. Um, not exactly the best picture of the Beatles. You know, kind of, you know, uh, and yeah, they, they looked like they'd been arrested. Yeah, good point, good point. Not a very thing. And this record didn't, yeah, I mean, really. And this did not come out. Um, it also was going to be an album called Sessions. And this is a picture of the Beatles behind Abbey Road Studios, kind of in the back alley. And these records were going to come out. And then the reason they didn't come out was uh, according to a capital memo, legal hold. In other words, lawsuit time. Around this time, the Beatles had felt that Capitol Records and EMI were selling tons of Beatle records, but the royalty checks didn't seem to be matching with what they expected. So Apple began one of many lawsuits against Capitol EMI. And what they said in the lawsuit essentially is, you all are screwing us out of our royalties. And EMI and Capital said, oh, no, that's not true. And eventually the case is settled. And in fact, Capital and EMI have to fess up that, yes, they had been unreporting Beatle sales. There were some rogue people at Capital in particular who were selling promotional records, which the Beatles would get no money for um, because they were supposedly promotional, but they were actually being sold, and some very other bad things. Um, but ultimately, the company settled it, but one of the things about the settlement was the Beatles wanted to get back for punitive damages their masters. The court said, no, we're not willing to go that far. But what the Beatles did get from EMI and Capital was creative control again. So for that reason, the record did not come out at that time. Eventually, Anthology would release all the songs that would have been out on sessions. Now, Capital did squeeze out one more single. Um, and that was that there was this movie that came out called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, in the soundtrack was the Beatles song Twist and Shout. So Capitol said, boy, you know, we got to put that out as a single. And it did reasonably well. It got to number 23 on the charts. And one of the things that I noticed was shortly after that record was released, and, and for several years thereafter, any time I went to, you know, a bar mitzvah, or anything like that, you know, the DJ playing records would play, you know, a lot of contemporary stuff and then twist and shout by the Beatles. Anytime you go to a football game, you know, during the house PA system, you hear twist and shout by the Beatles. So, you know, in a way it was good that they released it. It got more exposure for them. 10 minutes? Okay, I got 10 more minutes. Well, that's pretty good. All right. Um, so anyway, this is sort of what Capital was doing. And then we reached the CD age. The reason the Beatles catalog didn't come out on CD right away was that, well, there was litigation between Apple and EMI and Apple and Capital. Finally, when the litigation got settled, it was time to release the catalog. And that was nearly, well, that was over 20 years ago. The first batch came out in February of 1987. 
And what they did was they decided that we were going to get back to, we have creative control, meaning Apple, we're going to put out the British configuration albums throughout the world. And the first four came out. So I remember a lot of people who grew up in America, uh, you know, these come out and they see with the Beatles. I thought that was called Meet the Beatles. And, you know, where is I Want to Hold Your Hand? You know, that was my favorite song on Meet the Beatles. It's not on this album. And it did cause a little bit of confusion when the first batch came out and they had to explain how they were doing things. They also issued them only in mono. And there was a bit of confusion there. George Martin, on the first two albums, those songs had been recorded on a two-track recorder. What that meant was that you, you, and, you know, now you have what multitudes, you know, several hundred tracks. You know, each instrument gets a separate track. Each part of a drum kit gets a separate track. But in those days, they were using a two-track recorder. And George Martin thought stereo is for eggheads. It's really ridiculous. People listen in mono. So what he did was he recorded all the instruments on one side and all the vocals on one side so you could mix it down to get a good vocal balance. And so those first two albums, when you listen to them in stereo on vinyl, you know, I think it's kind of cool. You get vocals on one side, instruments on the other. Uh, the ultimate in karaoke. But, um, which by the way, I hate karaoke. Um, the one thing I love about Beetlefest is unlike Abbey Road on the River, I have never been next to a karaoke stage. Two times I was next to the karaoke stage. I cannot tell you how horrible that was, particularly when a guy in heavy metal garb came out and began to sing Hey Jude. That's when I turned to my assistant and I said, hey, I got to go off and interview the smithereens. And I didn't have an interview with the smithereens, but they were there and I had to get away. Oh, and by the way, I walked up to the security, hi, I'm here to interview the smithereens. I went up, I interviewed the smithereens, and then I ended up writing the liner notes for Meet the Smithereens. So this is all because of bad karaoke that I got to write the liner notes for Meet the Smithereens. This has been an amazing life. Well, anyway, round two comes out, and we have Help, Rubber Soul, Revolver, and of course, Sgt. Pepper out on CD. And then they come out with another round, and you'll notice here, Magical Mystery Tour. And that is the same exact configuration that Capitol Records came out in England. Magical Mystery Tour was an EP. 10 years later, the British realized that Capitol really had that one right. And so Magical Mystery Tour is part of the official British catalog. And then to fill in the gaps, they came out with this album, Past Masters, that had all the bits and pieces. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the second half of the Swan Book does. Um, as I've mentioned, it is my swan song as far as Beatles American record books go, because there really is nothing else to write about. Uh, I mentioned earlier the VJ book has sold out. For those of you lucky to own it, you probably are kicking yourself for not buying two or three of them, just as I'm kicking myself for not stashing a hundred of them away somewhere. You know, and it's kind of funny because uh, I had my nephew one time tells me, he's you know, very computer savvy, and he said, yeah, I was on eBay and I saw that, uh, you know, that VJ book just sold for $405. Uh, what do you think I can get for mine? <laughs> Look, I gave you that book, you know? I personalized it for you. You're my nephew. I know, but it's $405. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Well, anyway, um, and so um, the Apple book, for those of you who like stuff from that era, the Apple book is coming close to selling out, not as much as a capital book, but one day that'll be on eBay for outrageous money. And I know a lot of people say, well, why don't you reprint the books when they sell out? The economics aren't there. It's not like I can go to my printer and say, hey, give me 300 of this book. You need to do very large press runs to make it economical. And for that reason, you know, I'm reluctant to do second runs. Um, the Capital Story Volume 1, uh, Part 1, this one is very close to selling out. Uh, I have a grand total of about 100 copies of that book, period, and that's it. So I do expect it to sell out very soon. We do have copies here in the marketplace. You should buy it before it sells out because you will regret it if you see it on eBay for $250 when you could have bought it at my table for $50. And if I come back here next year and the book sold out and you ask me, why didn't I warn you, I'm warning you now. It's getting close to selling out. Uh, the Capital um, Part Two book with the albums, that's a fun book to own because it has a really great chapter on Sgt. Pepper. That alone is worth the price of admission. You'll learn a lot of little things about Sgt. Pepper that you didn't know. It's the 40th anniversary of this great album. 
It also has two chapters on the infamous Yesterday and Today Butcher cover. And that's just a couple of the chapters, covers all the Capitol albums. You should buy it and that gets you another drink because I once again shamelessly plugged the book. Start marking them down, that's right. We're gonna get everybody drunk here, thanks to Bruce. Um, and then um, this next book is actually my favorite book out of all the books I've done called The Beatles Are Coming. I've given that presentation here several times. I won't be doing that this year, but maybe next year I'll reprieve it. And it's, it's a really fun one. It tells the convoluted story of how Beatlemania evolved in America. I can tell you that if I had written that book as a work of fiction about a rock and roll band from England and tried to sell it to somebody, they would have laughed and said, this is sheer lunacy. Nothing like that could ever happen, but it did. Uh, the foreword of the book was written by Walter Cronkite. And the interesting thing about it was that Walter Cronkite unwittingly pushed the first domino that caused Beatlemania to explode in America. He pushed domino number one, which pushed a 15-year-old girl, which pushed a disc jockey in Washington, D.C. Um, for those of you that say, Bruce, I'd love to buy your books, but they're just too expensive for me, the paperback of this, we have it on sale for $15. That is less than a t-shirt. And as I tell people constantly, you do not learn anything from a t-shirt. <laughs> I know that gentlemen in the audience are saying, you do learn things from wet t-shirt contests, but that's not what I had in mind. So I do recommend that you run out and buy that book. For those of you that say, Bruce, we would buy your book, but they weigh four or five pounds, that's too heavy. We have this little booklet here. And this is the, the, kind of like the Reader's Digest version of Beatlemania in America. That's a companion book, which are the Capitol Albums, Volume 1. That, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's very, very light. But uh, anyway, so you lose that excuse. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there are people that told me one of the things they like about the new Swan book is that it covered the Capitol stuff from the 70s and 80s that they grew up with. They also tend to like this book, The Beatles' Solo on Apple Records, because it covers the stuff from you know, 1970 to 75, the Wings, you know, the Paul stuff, the Ringo stuff, and many people who grew up on that. And so that book is popular. Now, of course, I am here with two new books. This is the first time I've ever had two new books at an event coming out in one year, which is why I'm going to take a well-deserved vacation from writing Beatle books for a while. Um, this is a Beatles price guide, sixth edition, that I uh, published and edited by Perry Cox. The last one came out in 1999, long overdue. And so we do have copies of that available for sale in the marketplace. And of course, the new book, The Beatles' Swan Song. Now, normally when I would finish a talk, I would suggest that everyone rush into the marketplace and buy my books. But I really, in clear conscience, can't do that because after I finish, we have a wonderful speaker coming on. I'm not going to give him a full introduction. Terry will do that. But when you have Larry Kane following you, it's, it's kind of hard to tell people to run out to your table and buy your books. But of course, I hope sometime during today you do. And for those of you, maybe you say, gee, I've seen Larry a bunch. I'll buy the book and come back or whatever. That's OK. But I do encourage you to, of course, stay, because there's some great speakers in this room. Um, believe it or not, I think I have about two or three minutes left, which is really rare for me. Mark gave me a, a full 50 minutes. So let's have a big hand for Mark for giving me enough time. And uh, also, I have time, I guess, to take a question or two. Does anyone have a question or two? Yes. Yeah, the question, I'm going to anticipate it. The question is that there were rumors to the effect that John Lennon drew the album cover for rock and roll music, and rather than getting that gaudy 1950s thing, we could have had a John Lennon cover. Not entirely true, but close. John, when he heard about the collection, offered to do the cover for it, and Capitol turned him down, as best we can tell. No John Lennon cover has ever shown up anywhere. So I think all that we can really say is that John did not actually draw a cover. But I don't know. I mean, if, if I were Capitol Records at that time and John Lennon said, hey, I'd like to draw the cover for the new album, I'd probably at least want to look at what he had in mind. <laughs> you know, could be. Yes? Yeah, the question about, and we'll get to that real quick. And this will be the last question because then I'll put me right where we need to be. In rock and roll music, what I didn't mention, because I didn't know if I had time to get into it, George Martin was in Los Angeles at the time Capitol was compiling rock and roll music. And uh, when he kind of heard what they were doing with it, he was horrified because he felt, you know, these songs were recorded on two track way back then, and it's going to be released in stereo, vocals on one side, instruments on the other, so I need to remix them. 
So George Martin sort of remixed them. And the reason I say sort of is this. George Martin did not go back to Abbey Road to the original two tracks and four tracks. He worked with the stereo masters. But what he did was he panned things around so that if a song had instruments on one side and vocals on the other, he mixed things around a bit. So it wasn't really a true mix, but it was kind of panning things around and did rework the things. The weird thing, and I'd never asked Sir George this when I talked to him, because I think he'd probably say, oh, really, I didn't realize that, I don't remember, was that they reversed the channels. So what was on the left channel when the records came out originally was now on the right channel and vice versa. Why, I don't know. Great question. Uh, I know I'm right where I need to be time-wise, so I guess I will turn the mic over to Terry, who will then turn it over to, to Larry Kane. Not to be confused with Larry King.